Hey everyone, today we're going to talk about AWS's offering for storing time series data called AWS TimeStream. We're going to look at TimeStream itself and compare it to several other methods for storing time series data. First of all, let's talk about what time series data is. Time series data, quite simply, consists of data points that each have a timestamp associated with them. The easiest example of time series data is stock prices. For any given time, the price of a company's stock was at a specific value. Another example use case could be an analytics platform for a video streaming service. For any given point in time, you want to be able to retrieve the number of users watching movie A, for example. Back in the old days, it was pretty much a given that no matter what kind of data your service used, you were going to use a traditional generic SQL database. Nowadays, we're starting to see more and more databases that cater to specific use cases, like massive scale or certain types of schemas. They typically forego some flexibility to give you things like extra scalability, cost savings, ease of use, and so on. That's where TimeStream comes in. It relies on some key assumptions about your data. First, that each row must have a timestamp, one or more dimensions, like a ticker symbol, for example, and one or more values, like a stock price. Second, it assumes that your data tends to become less valuable as it gets older. Finally, and possibly the biggest assumption, it assumes that you never need to delete any data points. In exchange for working within these constraints, TimeStream offers low cost, automatic scaling, and extremely easy setup. Traditionally, relational databases have been the go-to solution for storing time series data. Since that's worked fine for so long, does TimeStream offer enough benefits to make it a serious alternative? And are there any other approaches we should consider? Let's consider several options for storing time series data, some of which are a bit atypical for doing so, and see how they compare to TimeStream. First, let's look at RDS, the most popular SQL database solution on AWS. RDS is a cloud-based packaging of some of the most prevalent open source databases like MySQL and PostgreSQL. If a database administrator from the 80s time traveled to the present day, this is a solution they'd likely be the most comfortable with. Some of the benefits of traditional relational databases are strict schema enforcement, the ability to normalize data, and, of course, the powerful SQL query language that allows you to quickly view your data from almost any angle you can imagine with just a handful of lines of code. RDS offers a vast array of flavors and options, each of which have their own pros and cons. Time series data can be stored in your RDS tables using a row per data point, with one or more dimensions being the primary key for the table, and the time stamp and values being additional columns in the table. The initial setup for RDS is a bit more difficult than that of the other databases we'll be talking about, especially if you aren't using the RDS data API. You have to deal with low-level networking configuration to make sure your service can communicate to the database. Once set up, however, it's hard to deny the power and flexibility of RDS for time series data. Some advantages of using RDS for time series data are that it's the most flexible solution both in terms of writing and reading. You can delete records, create indexes on non-primary key columns, reference other tables, and so on. Some downsides are that it has a much more involved setup than other solutions and likely a higher cost. Also, some might consider having a strict schema to be a downside. The next data store we'll consider for time series data is DynamoDB. DynamoDB is one of AWS's indigenous data stores, developed from scratch by Amazon and released back in 2012. While time series data is quite far from its target use case, it's worth considering if you already have DynamoDB expertise and infrastructure. The aspect of DynamoDB that makes it feasible for storing time series data is the ability to use a sort key in addition to a hash key. If you use an ISO 8601 timestamp as your sort key, timestamp ranges can be queried efficiently using the quality operators DynamoDB supports for hash keys. In our example, we use a stock ticker symbol as the hash key and a timestamp stamp as a sort key. Watch out here though, if there are multiple dimensions by which you need to query data or potentially might need to in the future, you'll have to run separate queries for both dimensions and filter the data in your service instead of having the database do it for you. Any aggregations you need to do will also need to be done in your service as well. Some advantages of using DynamoDB for time series data are that it's battle tested. It's been around for a long time and it's been used extensively. Its most famous use case being that for Amazon.com shopping cart. Some downsides are that it's intended for use as a key value data store, not for time series data. So while doing so is possible, it's kind of going against the grain. Complex queries and aggregations are not supported and consequently would have to be done in your service, which would likely require a large retrieval of data. Now let's look at CloudWatch. CloudWatch is AWS's offering that is geared primarily toward tracking metrics related to AWS services, such as how high resource usage is on your EC2 instances, how many requests your DynamoDB table is servicing, etc. But it also lets you publish custom metrics, so I thought I'd try using it to store arbitrary time series data. While I was able to get it to work, it's definitely the least flexible option. Some advantages of using CloudWatch for time series data are that it has built-in visualization in the AWS console. Some downsides are that published data points must have a timestamp within the past two weeks. Also, published data points aren't reflected in GET requests right away. Finally, to compare all of these with TimeStream, again, TimeStream is AWS's data store that caters specifically to time series data. First of all, it's serverless in that it abstracts away the need to manually manage servers, operating systems, and so on. It auto-scales so you never need to worry about how much capacity is allocated to your database. It also offers data lifecycle 
management. Typically with time series data, the most recent data is the most important and frequently accessed. As data gets older, it often becomes more infrequently accessed. Timestream leverages this phenomenon to achieve cost savings by automatically moving older data to a magnetic data store, which is much less expensive than the in-memory data store used for new data. Additionally, data is automatically deleted from the magnetic store when it reaches a certain age. Both of these age thresholds are configurable. Data can be held in memory for up to one year and can be held in the magnetic store for up to 200 years. Querying time stream data is done using traditional SQL queries, making it nearly as flexible as traditional SQL databases in terms of reading data. This is a pretty big deal if you want to transform and aggregate the data, things that wouldn't be possible with DynamoDB or CloudWatch. It also includes some special SQL functions that cater specifically to time series data like interpolation. One other thing that some might find useful is that time stream doesn't enforce a strict schema. To add new dimensions or measures to a table, the application can simply start submitting them and they will be automatically added to the table. To set up a TimeStream instance, simply go to the TimeStream console and click Create Database. Enter a name and optionally specify a master KMS key if you'd like, otherwise it'll just create one for you, which is probably fine for most people. Once you've created the database, click on Tables in the menu and then the Create Table button. Specify a table name and then decide on the most important values, the memory store retention period and the magnetic store retention period. Remember that you won't be able to write data with timestamps older than the memory retention period. For example, if your memory retention period is one day, you won't be able to write data that is older than one day in the past. If you have a substantial amount of data, it might make sense to have this period as small as possible, otherwise costs might start to balloon. In-memory storage actually costs 876 times as much as magnetic storage, at least in US West 2. The magnetic store retention period specifies when your data will be deleted forever. Once you've decided on these values, click the Create Table button and you're ready to go. To populate your time stream table with data, you have three options. The AWS CLI, the TimeStream Console Inline Query Editor, or the AWS SDK. Since you're likely going to publish data from a service, let's look at a Kotlin example using the AWS SDK. As always, I've included a link to the example code in the description down below. Even if you don't have experience with Kotlin, you'll be able to read the example code if you're familiar with something like C Sharp or Java. First, build a TimeStream write client by specifying an AWS region and any configuration overrides you'd like. The ones I have here from the TimeStream documentation example code. To prepare a data point for submission, we simply create a record object for each data point that we'd like to publish. Add any desired set of dimensions that you might want to use to distinguish different data points. In our case, that'd be a stock ticker symbol. Add a measure name and value. In our case, this will be the price of the stock. Then add a timestamp and epic time. That's all we need to do to build a time stream record. To submit the record, construct a write records request. This request object specifies the database and table to be written to and allows you to include a list of records so that you can submit multiple with one request. In our case, we're submitting 100 at a time. Then use the time stream write client write records function to submit the request. That's it. Now let's look at how to query the data. TimeStream provides an inline SQL query editor in the console, so let's use that to retrieve the data that we've just populated our table with. SQL lovers will feel right at home. In some ways, writing queries is indistinguishable from doing so for a traditional SQL database. You can get all the data, just the data for one stock using WHERE clause, for example, or even use a GROUP BY clause to get the average price of each stock. When working with time series data, there's almost always a desire to visualize it in the form of charts. One easy way to visualize data is using an open source visualization tool called Grafana. Grafana has a plugin that allows it to use TimeStream as a data source. On a Mac, you can install Grafana using Homebrew and then use the Grafana CLI tool to install the TimeStream plugin. After some simple configuration, we can get some nice looking graphs populated with data directly from our TimeStream table. Now let's look at the cost of TimeStream as compared to RDS. In the US West 2 region, for TimeStream you'll pay 50 cents per 1 million writes, 3.6 cents per gigabyte hour for data in the in-memory data store, and 3 cents per gigabyte month for data in the magnetic store. Queries are 1 cent per gigabyte scanned. Now, RDS has a ton of different factors that affect price, but we'll compare to the Aurora PostgreSQL serverless flavor. For that, you'll pay $0.06 cents per ACU hour, and ACU is basically a unit of compute capacity, $0.10 cents per gigabyte month for storage, and $0.20 cents per million requests. On the surface, it does seem like if you can keep your TimeStream in-memory storage size relatively small, TimeStream can offer substantial savings over an equivalent RDS serverless setup. If you need to have several gigabytes of data in the in-memory store window, the savings may evaporate quickly though. Now, of course, all these prices are from the time this video was made in 2021, so if you're a time traveler coming from the future, things may have changed. So let's take a look at the overall advantages and downsides of TimeStream. The advantages are that it's likely lower cost than other solutions, it's serverless, it has auto-scaling, it has a simple API, it's very easy to set up, and it allows for flexible querying using SQL. Finally, it's easy to add new fields because of no strict schema enforcement. Now for some downsides about TimeStream. The biggest one in my opinion is that you can't delete records. You also can't store any data points prior to the memory store retention period. 
You also can't store data points in the future, which for most people that's probably not an issue, but if you're doing something like storing predictions or something, that might be a deal breaker. In conclusion, if you have time series data, AWS time stream should definitely be an option on the table. In a lot of ways, it combines the best aspects of a traditional SQL database with the scalability and ease of use of something like DynamoDB. But it does impose more constraints than an RDS-based solution would, so that definitely needs to be taken into account. To me, the biggest downside is the inability to delete data. Other than that, it seems like a very compelling option. As always, code examples I've referenced in the video are linked down below in the description. I really hope this video has been helpful for you. Please let me know in the comments if I've gotten anything wrong or missed anything. If not, which I hope is the case, let me know what solution you use for your time series data and how you like it. With that, we'll see you in the next one.